transaction gives properties to application developers that really nothing else does. And uh, I, I really like it. So first off, I'd like to ask, how many of you actually write apps against databases? Okay. How many of you, you know, use uh, both relational and NoSQL? Okay. How many of you have used RDS? Ah, okay. That, that's good to know. How many of you know what Aurora is? Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll get there. So this is a, a good place to start. So today I'm going to talk about uh, what's RDS. I'll go through that kind of quickly. Um, I hate it when it auto advances. What is RDS? Um, we'll talk about what is Aurora Postgres. Uh, I'll do a quick little thing about getting data into AWS. I actually have a video if you care. Uh, and then I'm, we're going to be announcing a new feature called Performance Insights. And how many of you have ever had to debug a performance uh, database performance problem? Yeah, so you'll be really interested, I hope, and I'd love feedback from you on that, as that product is about a month from GA, and any feedback you give me would be pretty valuable. So I'm not going to make you read this at 7 p.m. at night. Net-net um, net is RDS tries to be the best database administrator for you we can. We try and save you money. We try and save your butt when backups don't work, because no one cares about backups. They actually just care about restoring them. Um, we do all sorts of stuff to give you lots of database choices, and we try to do it with better security than you could probably do yourself. And I think Terry hit the nail on the head talking about security, 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 security. And that is job zero at AWS. And so everything we do revolves around security. So basically, I'm not sure how many of you can read that, but if you think about the things you can do on computers, you have power, stacking, racking, etc. That's one tier. The next tier past that is running your operating system, running your database, and then the thing you'd really want to do, if, unless you're a database developer like me, is you'd really want to you know, do things like consult with your devs, do database deep dives, help people with performance, and design new applications to move your business forward. There are very few of us who are interested in a lot of that stuff in the red. So AWS certainly helps move a bunch of that stuff, just even on EC2, move that stuff out to the cloud um, and help you do all that and help us maintain it at a very high level of quality. RDS is about the next part, about moving scaling, high availability, backups, software patches, and installs also in RDS, leaving you to do the stuff you want to do. For those of you who haven't seen it, which appears to be a lot of you, RDS gives you a single pane of glass or API that allows you to actually manage all of your databases, SQL Server, Oracle, MySQL, Aurora, etc. We have, you just go to the console or you go to an API, you can spin up a database. That's it, that's all it takes. No installation, we'll handle patches, we'll do monitoring, I'll get into that in a bit. We let you scale up and down. We have different kinds of security I'll hit. So the first thing is backups and recovery. And I list this first because this is the thing you should care most about on your databases. We will do nightly backups of your database and we'll keep them up to 35 days. And you can restore to any point in time of your database within the last 35 days up to millisecond accuracy, depending on the engine. So MySQL I think is second accuracy. Um, anytime you want with a single API call. So when your boss says, oh crap, someone loaded up that app, which changed all the employee numbers to prime numbers, uh, you can say, well, why don't we restore to 2.01 p.m. and fix that problem. We also offer multi-AZ. Now, I'm not sure which side of this equation you guys all fit on, but typically when we have an outage, we all go look at the outage of our database, we figure out what happened, and we go back to our boss, or our boss comes to us, and we say, well, we figured out what that was. It'll never happen again, I promise. Well, 90 days later, something else happens, and you go to your boss and you say, well, we figured out what that was, and it'll never happen again. Well, I run the largest database fleet in the world. What's not on my uh, card there is that I actually run all of RDS operations in all regions for uh, AWS, and while I've been standing here in the uh, 10 minutes and 27 seconds I've been standing here, we've had approximately 22 failovers in the fleet. And my pager in my pocket goes off if one of them doesn't work. That's part of what it means to be a general manager at AWS. 
Imagine that 365. We have crawled into all the dark, deep corners of high availability, hopefully so that you don't have to. You can create a synchronous standby and a different availability with a single click or a single API call. In the need of failover, it's typically 40 to 60 seconds with RDS. With Aurora, we're seeing failover times as low as five seconds in some cases. This could be a loss of availability in an AZ. This could be loss of the connectivity to a primary. It could be something failing on your primary database. Hardware does fail. Or we actually have a theory at AWS that you should never have an error path which you don't exercise all the time. So we actually use failover as our mechanism for doing scaling of CPU or storage or patching. So we'll actually patch the secondary and then fail over to it and build a new secondary for you out of the primary. So that code is executed all the time. We let you run all sorts of different instances. I think I saw from Terry, a lot of you know AWS really well, so I won't go into this. We'll let you scale storage if you want to go from two terabytes to four terabytes. You'll have very minimal downtime. We'll build the second volume and then we'll just get you over to it really quickly. There will be a performance impact, but you can just scale with no downtime. <coughs> Not only that, you can add read replicas. Again, with just a click on the console. My best example, I have a video of this, which I'm not going to show you today, is that your boss has decided that your uh, customers in Europe uh, actually are really pissed off at your response time, so they've asked you to stand up a read replica in Dublin. It takes about seven minutes to get things set up. It takes about four hours, by the way, for it to copy over the first snapshot and get it done. And then from that point, it keeps up with about three to five seconds of delay, and now you have your read replica in Dublin. And then when your boss, as bosses sometimes do, says, I'm at Frankfurt, you say, oh, okay, you click delete on the console, you click stand up when in Frankfurt, and you're done. And we do it all for you, including standing up a completely separate, unique VPN per read replica to master connection. Getting back again to what Terry was saying about the importance of keys. Unfortunately, RDS is only as good as the engines it manages. We manage seven engines. Two of our own, uh, open source inspired engines we like to call them, compatible, Aurora MySQL and Aurora Postgres. We manage three open source engines, Postgres, MySQL, and MariaDB. And we manage two commercial engines, Oracle and SQL Server. And those all run on top of the RDS platform. So let's get back into the key point of the talk today I want to say is what is Aurora Postgres? Well, the question I'll cut off at the pass is it's not GA yet. Um, I'm hoping to have it be GA really soon now, but it's not GA yet. We're currently working through some performance certification work. Um, I don't know why it keeps advancing on me. Um, so why did we do Aurora Postgres? Because traditional relational databases are really hard to scale. This goes all the way back to the V5 through, uh, even today, V12 versions of Oracle. If you put everything into a stack, and I promise you I'm not clicking, if you put everything into a stack, you get things that can't scale. They all either have to scale together or they have to scale separately and slowly. So let's look at what people have tried over the last 40 years, including me. Sharding, well about the only thing you can say about sharding is it's not quite as bad as the other things up here. Okay, uh, Sharding imposes application work, you have to do stuff, and then when your application changes or your key management changes, it sucks. You could do shared nothing, two-phase commit, well, that doesn't work very well. Or you could do shared disk, which is what Oracle Rack was. I was actually one of the architects on Oracle Rack. Do any of you use Oracle Rack in your jobs? Okay. Uh, we tried really hard to make that easy to use and kind of fail. So each architecture is limited by this monolithic mindset. And so what would you do if you were to design a database today? What you would do is you would actually use a microservices architecture, you'd break things out, and you'd have what in computer software we call separation of concerns. And so the separation of concern that we did with Aurora was we separated out the logging and storage out of the Aurora, out of the MySQL database into its own layer. And that layer is self-operating, self-healing, self-scaling completely independent of the thing going up on up above, which is SQL transactions and caching. 
And now here's the marketing slide. We're adding Postgres to it, which is we're really excited about. Why are we adding Postgres? Over 90% of the features we add in Amazon can be traced back to what we call PFRs in Salesforce, which is customer requests. When I launched Aurora MySQL on October 6, 2014, I believe, I had 16 customer meetings that day and the next day. In 14 of them, customers said, hey, can we have Postgres too? The good news was I'd started the project 15 months earlier, but even now in 2017, we're not quite done yet. Um, but we do it because customers have asked for it. It's that simple. Postgres is a different database than MySQL. It's been out there for 20 years, just like MySQL, but it's owned by a foundation, not by a single company. And you might go, why does that matter? Well, it actually matters because the guys who control the contributor, they don't actually give a crap about the next quarter's profits or about some big company who's really eager for some replication feature. They only let people check in the code if the code is beautiful. And for those of you who ever looked at the GitHub of Postgres, it is some of the nicest code out there. And it's because they just keep pushing back. Uh, Bidirectional replication, they've been trying to get in now for five years. They may actually get it in for version 10 because they finally made the code good enough for the committers. It's high performance out of the box. One of our biggest concerns with going GA with Aurora Postgres is that it's already, Postgres out of the box, is two and a half times faster than MySQL. So it's really hard to make claims like, hey, five times faster like we did with Aurora MySQL. We can only say two times faster because Einstein starts kicking in. Um, it's object oriented. It has the most geospatial features. There's a lot of people who use Postgres. Uh, there's a couple mapping applications that run on your phone which actually use RDS Postgres right now. And this is a really important one for some of our customers, maybe less for this audience. It is the most Oracle compatible open source database. It's been designed from day one. They just keep adding Oracle compatibility after Oracle compatibility features. And for our enterprise customers, this is hugely important. During one of my other stints as a GM in Amazon, I actually ran the schema conversion tool in the database migration service. And I've now given those off to another really awesome GM. And we are getting conversion rates over tens of thousands of migrations of between 60 and 70% for Oracle to RDS Postgres. We are getting over that same tens of thousands of conversions, 30 to 50% going to MySQL. Now that might not seem like much until you have 3 million lines of PL SQL and little things like 30% or 60% start mattering. There's a question in the back. Sorry, I just wanted to know what's happening with SQL Server as well. Are you getting the same kind of conversions to Postgres from, from enterprise SQL Server shops or only Oracle? So you know, it's funny, I, I, I promise to never make anything up and I actually don't have that data with me. But I'm absolutely happy, my email is on here, I will get that data for you if you send me an email. I, I feel kind of bad I don't have it. Um, sorry. I have a feeling it's actually pretty good, except for the fact that MySQL was actually kind of designed by some people who knew SQL Server pretty well. So I've heard the conversion rates are actually better for MySQL from SQL Server than from Oracle, which is ironic given who owns it right now. So what does it mean when we do Postgres? It doesn't mean we wrote a database from scratch. We're not stupid. We took the Postgres source code. We modified it. We tore out the bottom end and we put it on Amazon Aurora Storage. And here's a key thing for you when you're thinking about using this product. It is 100% application compatible or it's a bug. And I make that promise to you as the GM for the indefinite future. I may add some features to it, but if you stick with something that is Postgres compatible, your application will be compatible. It uses KMS, it uses IAM roles, it's easy to manage, it's part of the RDS stable. You can load it and unload it using DMS and the schema conversion tool. And like I said, it's fully compatible. So let's get into some actual technology. What did we do to make it durable and available? Well, the first thing we did is we broke apart that green <coughs> shared storage volume from the database. And so it writes six copies of every single write you do to three AZs. Not one, not two, not four. It writes six copies of every write. How can that possibly scale? Well, the only way it scales is because we don't write data blocks. 
like an 8K data block or 16K data block, we only write redo records. The storage system down there, the green, actually knows all about the database and it knows what to do when it gets a change record and it knows how to apply it to a data block. That storage node down there in a large region is typically between hundreds and thousands of storage servers. And so IO is no longer a problem. So what this means is that though you're doing six times as many writes, at the same transaction load we typically see 9x less network traffic, which leaves the CPU on the node to do more of its job. And what was its job? Processing SQL. And so you're going to hear for the next five or ten slides this concept that one of our themes was to let the database do the database's job and get everything possible off that database node so that it could do more of its job. So I've talked about how the data is replicated six times across three AZs, and there's the three AZs with the six nodes. It backs up continuously. There's no database backup. There's no impact on the storage on the head node for backups. There's no maintenance windows. It just, or backup windows. It just does its thing for you all the time continuously. Um, it also monitors itself all the time, and I'll get to that, the coolness there in a second. And the other thing it does is it does four out of six quorum. If you look at across thousands of databases, or in my case, tens of thousands of databases, or hundreds of thousands in our larger regions, do you know what affects performance more than almost anything else? Network jitter and I.O. jitter. It's that long last I.O. when there was some pause in a network or some router decided to reboot or was getting downloaded ACLs. That is actually the single largest reason why databases are unpredictable and suck. So, the second reason is lack of indices. I'll get to that. By, we will write six times and we will consider the write committed when we get four replies. So those last two replies, which may be taking, instead of you know, 400 microseconds, maybe they're taking 3.5 milliseconds. I don't really care. It just comes back and says, I got four out of six, let's move on. Well, unfortunately, what did I do when I did that? I just incurred a debt, because maybe that fifth, that right, or that sixth right are never coming back. Maybe something bad happened. Well, so what the system does is it thinks about that all the time, and you can lose a disk, this doesn't have a laser pointer on, you can lose a disk, which is the middle box in AZ2, you can lose an entire storage node, which is either of those boxes, or God forbid, you could actually lose connectivity to an entire AZ. Now, AZ, um, Amazon has never lost a full AZ. We have lost connectivity to AZs for minutes at a time, and uh, the whole goal of this software is to just keep running your transactions. So what happens if you lose a disk? Well, the storage nodes, see all those horizontal lines? The storage nodes all chat amongst each other and go, holy crap, you don't have the data? Well, let me get you the data. Or you lose an entire storage node. That's how it works. So going back to that concept of exercising the failure path during normal operation, how do you think we add storage to our storage clusters? I just go and shoot nodes left and right that I don't want anymore, and I add new ones. And it sits there and sees new storage nodes with no use on them, and it load balances across them all. So the storage code, which is actually meant to be used only in times of failure, is used regularly. We use it all the time. Every day, we're expanding our storage nodes. And I would advise you and your software to make sure that you are always exercising your failure path somehow, because otherwise it won't be there when you need it. So in the interest of time, you can imagine we have read replicas. I'm not going to talk much. We will support up to 15 read replicas with less than 10 millisecond lag. Now, my product right now, I'm running 22 milliseconds lag, which is why I can't release yet. I'm working on it. I talked about continuous backup. The storage system is always backing up to S3 all the time, 24-7. If S3 takes an outage, not that that would ever happen, but if S3 was to ever take an outage, it sits there and it knows how to dual host S3 and it knows how to keep S3 running. Our failover now, this slide is actually out of date, we actually are seeing somewhere around 10% of our failovers occur in five seconds or less on Amazon Aurora. And we're pretty proud of that. We're gonna be working more to get it less and less and less. So let's talk a little bit about performance, because as Larry Ellison said once, there's only three things I care about in databases, performance, performance, and performance. 
So we ran uh, a big system. We ran uh, 45,000 IOPS. We ran the same nodes on both sides at M416XL. And the orange in this is going to be Amazon Aurora, and the blue is going to be Postgres. So th this is actually significantly better today. I actually just got a graph before coming here. Um, but you know, we were t more than 2x better on a TPC-like benchmark. On Sysbench, this graph has also gotten up to about 135 on that orange line on the right um, as of today. Like literally, I just got these graphs today um, with our new version of software. We can run, like I said, about 140,000 writes per second uh, on that same node. And here's a funny thing. Database initialization is three times faster than Postgres. How many of you use Postgres? How many of you hate vacuum? <laughs> I, your hands should have just stayed up. So Postgres has this really awesome concurrency model, which copies blocks rather than forcing the database to do the work at the time of the write. The problem is this causes tables to bloat and bloat and bloat. And so you have to do this thing called vacuum. Um, euphemistically, it's basically paying the debt you incur when you do your fast commit. And what this can do if you don't manage it well as a DBA is you can, it can shut down your database. I won't get into why in this talk, but it will. So if you'll notice, Amazon Aurora isn't actually that much faster at copying in. We made some things. But vacuum it sure is a lot faster. And one of the things on our roadmap is literally getting rid of vacuum. Is Postgres with no vacuum. Now I can't promise that yet, maybe later this year, early next year. But that is something we're very focused on. Next, if you think about the blue of Postgres, if you look at the very bottom line there where it hits the orange line of Amazon Aurora, you're like, wow, it's just as fast, isn't it, Mark? What's this crap you're telling me about being faster? It actually is, the response time is just as fast. Except for all the other times when it's writing full page data blocks, I mentioned that, and those really big spikes are when it's doing checkpoints. Checkpoints are when it has to clear the cache of all modified data blocks and actually get those out to the storage system. Well, because I have a storage system that is transaction aware, when I tell the storage system what I want to do, that I want to be a transaction X, it's a single API call to the storage system says, you know, instead of being a transaction Y, let's be a transaction X instead. And the storage nodes all go, okay, that's fine. So one of the best things here is instead of making the database do recovery, back to the theme of the best work is no work, or Knuth's the best code is no code, is just don't do recovery. There is no recovery in Amazon Aurora, and I'll get to that in a slide in a second. Uh, this slide just shows that the jitter is a lot less on Aurora. It, it basically is the uh, Fourier transform of this. Uh, at scale, Aurora scales better. We put a lot of work into modifying the Postgres engine. Frankly, the Postgres engine is pretty good, so we didn't get as much out of it as we got out of MySQL three years ago. Here's a cool slide, though. As you have to, as you optimize Postgres, those bottom three areas, in order to make Postgres recover faster. In, sorry, in order to make Postgres faster and faster, you go up to 12.5 gigabyte checkpoints, and now your recovery time to read all that data is 102 seconds. Where Aurora, we just said there are no checkpoints, so let's optimize everything to get 90,000 writes per second, and the recovery time is 1.2 seconds. And it just goes through. And that recovery time is constant across whatever you do. Now, if you run applications, you know full well that DBAs love to tell you how fast their database recovers. And then you have a cold cache, right? I'll get into that in a second, because a cold cache is just as much of a database outage to your application as the database actually being down. And most database people love to ignore that when they talk to you. I don't. So how do we do it? Well, the first thing is we do less. I'm going to kind of move ahead on this. We're efficient. We do everything asynchronously. In MySQL, we kind of lobotomized the uh, database kernel. There was an awful lot of, shall we say, opportunities for improvement there. Um, in Postgres, there wasn't as much to do, but we did do a lot of stuff around locking, and we did an awful lot of stuff around the way it takes transaction snapshots. So if you think about RDS for Postgres, what it does, it, the primary does a write, EBS has two copies. I don't know how many of you know that EBS always has two copies. <laughs> then it writes over in parallel to the other node, and the other node also does two copies. 
the key thing to note here is that remember the goal was to keep the database running? The database can't keep running until steps one through five on this slide have completed. Remember that jitter argument I told you about? Over hundreds of thousands of databases monitored for years, this is not a great architecture to reduce jitter. By the way, it's a great architecture for durability. It's just not a great architecture to reduce jitter. So in Aurora, we've talked about how we do the four out of six quorum. We've talked about six times more log writes, 9x less network traffic, no data block writes. The other thing we do is we put all of our log records together into big batches that go out. So Amazon Aurora is optimized for high throughput workloads. If you were to put a workload with one reader and one writer on it, it's going to be the same speed as Postgres. It won't be faster. Because fundamentally, you still have to write to a disk. You still have to wait for a response from a disk. Um, arguably, it'll actually be slower because I have to wait for a response from another AZ, which is typically in most Amazon regions around 850 to 1100 microseconds. Um, and we're working on that. So Amazon Aurora is optimized for high concurrent workloads, a couple thousand connections, things like that. I won't get into this too much. We group all our commits together. We're pretty clever with timing. Um, we understand enough about the storage system to know when each storage node can take more transactions and when it can't. We actually know enough about slow storage nodes to explicitly evict them from the cluster and tell the storage system to spin up new ones um, so that we could, if, we, if we experience a lot of jitter. It's the kind of thing you would do as a DBA where you'd go, I seem to have a slow disk form. Okay, let's go replace it. We'll do that automatically under the covers. Now, for those of you who are storage nerds, you'll appreciate this slide. If you look at the upper left, 